Jesus and asked, Is it lawful for a husband to divorce his wife? They were testing him. He said to them in reply, What did Moses command you? They replied, Moses permitted a husband to write a bill of divorce and dismiss her. Jesus told them, Because of the hardness of your hearts, he wrote you this commandment. But from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife. The two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, God has joined together. No human being must separate. In the house, the disciples again questioned Jesus about this. He said to them, Whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery against her. And if she divorces her husband and marries another, she commits adultery. The people were bringing children to him that he might touch them, but the disciples rebuked them. When Jesus saw this, he became indignant and said to them, Let the children come to me. Do not prevent them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Amen, amen, I say to you. Whoever does not accept the kingdom of God like a child will not enter it. Then he embraced them and blessed them, placing his hands on them. The Gospel of the So in today's readings, in both the, uh, the first reading and the gospel, we hear about the Bible's teaching about oh, excuse me about the Bible's teaching about marriage and divorce, right? which of course becomes the, the church's teaching. And this comes up every few years, and I, and I think it's important that we talk about it today. And I want to talk about kind of the you know, obviously I think we all understand it's a, it's a pretty controversial teaching. Even among Christian denominations, there's many Christian denominations today that, that allow divorce in their churches. And the Catholic Church has always been adamant that we don't believe in divorce. And that's a very controversial thing. So I think it's important that we understand why the church teaches that. But then I think it's also important that we talk about the, the beautiful aspect, right, about what the church really teaches about marriage. Sometimes when we, when we think about church teaching about this, we think about it in a, in a negative way. But we forget the, the flip side of that. It's what the church is trying to protect and uphold. So I think it's important that we talk about that a little bit today. Okay, so first of all, just specifically, what, what does the church teach? The church teaches exactly what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches that divorce is not permitted. Jesus himself said it right here in Mark 10, right, what we read from today. I remember I had, a, I remember I had a, a friend when I was first ordained, and she was telling me how she was starting to read the Bible, right, starting to read the Gospels. And she read this passage right, where Jesus clearly condemns divorce. And she said, you know, I don't understand how people can have so many beefs with the church, right? They're just teaching what the church, what Jesus himself taught. Right? And that's true. We don't believe in divorce. But it's important that we don't misunderstand what that means. Sometimes people are in a relationship that is as harmful to themselves or even harmful to their children, right, to their families. The church doesn't teach that somebody has to stay married or stay living with somebody if it's an abusive kind of relationship. Uh, some, something that uh, a lot of Catholics misunderstand too, some people think that if somebody gets divorced, it's like they're excommunicated and they can no longer receive the sacraments. That's not true. When people get divorced and then they remarry somebody else without an annulment, that's when they can't receive the sacraments. But somebody who just gets a divorce, that doesn't mean they can't still participate in the church and receive the sacraments, right? And again, why, why does Jesus say that divorce is not permitted. He says that what God has joined together, no man must put asunder. What God has joined together, no man must put asunder. And what does that mean? I'm, I'm sure many of you are familiar with the church idea of, of, of annulments. Right? Right? On your head, yes, you know what annulment is. Right? Heard this, right? Again, annulments are something that's very controversial. If yourself or, or you know somebody who's gone through the process, right? It, it's kind of a difficult process. And sometimes people wonder, you know, why, why is it so complicated? Again, it's because we believe the Bible. We believe Jesus. We can't contradict his teachings. Jesus said you can only get married once. And once somebody gets married, nobody can put that asunder. So what, what is an annulment then? 
An annulment is not the same thing as a divorce. A divorce means that people get married, and then for, for whatever reason they decide to you know, break up. That's not what an annulment is. An annulment comes down to what a sacrament is. As Christians and as Catholics, we believe that marriage is a sacrament, right? That, that when you come to get married, it's not just a contract between the two parties. It's a covenant between themselves and God. And it becomes a sacrament. And for every sacrament in the church, there's certain requirements in order for it to be legitimate. Uh, like, for example, we're going to have this baptism right, today. Say, say the pipes weren't working at our church and, you know, we, we couldn't find some water. And so I said, well, we have some Coca-Cola in the sacristy. Maybe I'll use that to baptize the child. It wouldn't work. You have to use water to baptize. If, if we were going to have Mass and, and we found out just before Mass started that, that we were out of wine. And we said, well, it's not a big deal. We'll just use some grape juice. Again, it's not a legitimate Mass. You can't make the Eucharist with grape juice. You have to use bread and wine. There's requirements for every sacrament. And so the same thing happens with marriage. There's certain requirements in order for it to be a sacramental marriage in which God joins those two people to death do you part. So what would be some examples of those requirements not being met? What, what the church teaches is that the two people that come to get married, they have to be freely making the decision they have to truly understand what they're getting into. And there can't be any pressure of any kind. So what would be an example of a marriage that could possibly be annulled? The most obvious one is if, if somebody is in an arranged marriage. They don't actually choose their spouse. They're forced into it. The church would say that's not really a valid sacrament. It's not really a, a legitimate uh, form of marriage. And so it could be annulled. Or what happens if, if a couple is, they're only getting married because there's some sort of external pressure upon them to get married? Like maybe one of the spouses is being threatened by the other person. Or, or maybe there's a, there's a pregnancy or something like that that is, that is causing them to get married and they otherwise won't have. Or maybe one of the spouses is actually keeping a secret from the other person. Like maybe one of the spouses is, is already having an affair or something like that. And they're not telling the other person. Or one of those spouses has some like severe mental condition that they're keeping from their spouse. Those are the kinds of things that would be a, a rationale for a marriage being in an old. And the reason why the process takes so long in the church is because Jesus said you can only get married once. And at the end of the annulment process, there's a priest who has to sign all the documentation. And he says, on pain of my immortal soul, I truly believe that this marriage can be an old was not a valid sacrament. That's why the process is so long and detailed. Well, that's what an omen is. It's, it's not a divorce. It's saying that for whatever reason, when the two people got married, one of those requirements was not met. And therefore, they do have a right to have the marriage annulled. <laughs> that's what an omen is. You know, I think when we, when we realize that, it's, it's not as, as hard to understand. Yes, it's difficult. But the point is, is that we're truly, if we're going to truly be Christians, we really have to follow what Jesus teaches. If Jesus said we can't allow divorce, then the church can't allow it either. But we do have a moment. Uh, so that's kind of the, the negative aspect of, of what the church teaches about marriage. But what I want to focus on is, you know, the beauty of the church's teaching about marriage. I think one of the most sad and tragic things in our culture today is that so many people think that the church's teachings about love and marriage are, are just so negative and so prohibited. But think about it. The reason why there's so many rules about marriage and about annulments and everything else is because the church holds marriage in such high esteem. You know, I remember when I, when I first came to St. Bernard, there were these, these catechists who used to teach confirmation class. And I remember they always said, you know, Father, we have all these requirements for people to get confirmed. We need to make marriage preparation a lot harder. And the reason he said that is he said, you know, confirmation is a beautiful thing that happens to everybody. But, you know, people who get married, that's something that is a lifelong commitment. And we need to really make sure people are prepared. Again, he wasn't trying to be negative. He was just trying to say this is so important. And therefore, it merits a lot of work. The church's teaching about marriage is that marriage is one of the most amazing gifts that God gives to humanity. 
Basically, the whole Bible, if you read the story of the Bible, it's a story all about marriage. It starts with the marriage between Adam and Eve, and then it talks about the marriage between God and Israel. God calls his people like his bride. And then when Jesus died on the cross, right, St. Paul in the New Testament, he said that, that Christ's death on the cross was where the bridegroom gave up his life for his bride, the church that he loved. Even the book of Revelation, right, when the book of Revelation ends, it talks about the marriage feast of the Lamb. It says that when you and I, when we get to heaven, pray God one day, it's going to be like a marriage, a marriage feast. And the kind of union that we experience with God and the happiness we experience with God is something that even marriages here on earth are just a shadow. And when people get married here on earth, it's a foretaste of the amazing experience we all have in heaven. And it's not just what the Bible teaches either, it's what the church teaches, right? When, when we talk about the Mass, for example, one of the ways that the Mass is described and called is called the marriage feast. Why is that? Because at Mass, when we receive the Eucharist, God comes down to us and we literally become one flesh with God and the Eucharist. The church teaches that every vocation, whether somebody gets married or a vocation of the priest or their consecrated life, it imitates marriage. That even priests and religious sisters, we're celibate, but that's because our bride is the church. That just as married couples, when, when they come together to get married, and they take on their wedding rings as a sign of their consecration to one another in service of the world. That's why religious sisters, they always wear wedding veils. Because they're wedded to the church. Priests, why do we wear white collars around our neck? It's like our wedding ring. Every vocation in the church is an imitation of marriage, of love and sacrifice. It's beautiful what the church teaches. And really, it, it all goes back to, to the beginning of the Bible, right? From the book of Genesis, which we also heard from today. Which, is, you know, it's just this amazing reading. Some of the things, you know, it teaches. It talks about the creation of, of Eve. Which, by the way, you guys all know the, you guys all know the joke about, you know, where Eve gets her name, right? That Eve, in the beginning, she was called woman, right? You guys know the story of how that happened? Adam was asleep, and he woke up, and he saw Eve for the first time, and he said, Oh, man. <laughs> well, that's where the, where the name comes from, right? It's a funny joke that you know, priests like to share. Right? You know, it's really, it, there really is some amazing things from this, you know, this reading from Genesis that, that some of us, we, I think we overlook. Sometimes, we again, we think about the Bible, and we think that, you know, it's, it's teachings about marriage or, or outdated or, or, or something like that. And often they're misunderstood. But I wonder if you, if you paid attention to some of the things the Bible said this morning in the book of Genesis. The end of the reading, it says, This is why a man leaves his father and mother and clings to his wife. And the two become one flesh. You know, some people think that the Bible teaches that in the Old Testament, like it was okay for people to get married to multiple people. It's not true. It doesn't say he clings to his wives. To his wife. When people had multiple wives in the Old Testament, it was always implicitly condemned by God. Or, or what else does it say? Remember the, the story when it says that Adam was all alone and God said he needed to make a suitable partner. Again, sometimes we misunderstand this because it's hard to translate this line. Some translations say like a helpmate or a partner, and none of them really get at it. Because it almost sounds like Eve is there to serve him. But what the Bible really says, this word in Hebrew, it's the same word that's used throughout the Bible to describe God's relationship with his people. It's, it's the word called etzer. And when the people of Israel, when they, were, when they were like completely desperate, and they were surrounded on all sides by enemy armies, they called God their etzer, like their savior. The Bible doesn't teach that Eve was just meant to serve Adam. It says that, that Adam needed Eve. He was incomplete. Men and women need each other. Women bring something that men can't. You know, there's a reason why here at the church, I make a point to have so many women on our, our key positions of staff, right? And the councils. It's because I know that they have a wisdom that I don't. They see things that I don't see. And that's just kind of what the Bible teaches. The Bible also says that when, when Eve was taken from the side of Adam, that she was built up. And again, that word, that's the same word that's used to describe later on in the Bible of when the temple 
was built up. That Eve is a temple. That just as the temple was, was the pride of Israel, so likewise women are the, are the pride and crown of creation. That's what the Bible teaches. You know, something I noticed for the first time this weekend as I was reading these readings, again, is something that really struck me. That when Adam was asleep, God took his side to make Eve. And I, and I think when I always read that, I always just kind of had this, you know, this, this surface level reading of what that meant. But think about that. In order for Adam to have his bride, he literally had to sacrifice his own flesh and blood for her. Love takes sacrifice. Every man who marries a woman, it costs immense sacrifice, and that's exactly how it should be. The, the Bible doesn't teach that marriage is just some secondary vocation. The Bible teaches that marriage is, is everything. It's of the utmost importance. And that's precisely why Jesus' teachings were so strict. He wants everybody to remember the immense dignity that is the vocation of marriage. And so on this weekend, I pray that all of us might have a renewed love for the vocation that we're in, whether it's consecrated life or marriage. They all might take it seriously. That it is a sacrament that God has destined for us to participate in the salvation of the whole world.